Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session, Marketing Campaigns Across Three Screens. Here is our moderator, Partner Omelette, Steve Amato. Good morning. Well, thank you. It still smells like Daryl Hall here, uh, <laughs> uh, which is a wonderful thing. But um, so thank you for coming. Good morning. Um, we are very excited to have a great panel and a great uh, bunch of experts here to talk about three screen marketing, which really is not true because there's a hell of a lot more screens than three screens. But for the sake of what we're talking about today, we're going to you know, keep it to the three screens. Um, so yes, uh, with no further, I would like to actually introduce, have everyone introduce them, say, uh, say something about their company and, and, their, and who they are. So starting with Chad. Great. So hello, Chad Stubbs with uh, Pepsi Cola, North America, uh, beverage marketing. Uh, it's a very sexy, uh, <laughs> s sexy name. Um, work in the media uh, investment team, and um, have had the you know uh, fortune to work with actually a lot of the companies up here, and um, glad to be here. Been at Pepsi for 10 years, and uh, currently am over all of the investment for uh, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, and Sierra Mist. Uh, Cameron Deeth, I am uh, the run the digital studio at NBC Universal, um, or Comcast in about 20 minutes, I think it is. <laughs> um, we um, have been around for about three years. We, my team is responsible for raising financing, producing and distributing original content um, that we do across all of our platforms, um, all of the screens that we have access to. Uh, what's pretty unique is we do that in partnership with brands as our financing and co-producing partners from the outset. Morning, my name is Jan Woland. I'm with Microsoft. I run national sales for both online video and uh, Admira, which is our advanced TV product. And, and we've recently brought those groups together because that's our belief around sight, sound, and motion. And that's how committed we are to this multi screen approach. I'm Katie Lay. I'm the brand manager for Honey Bunch of Votes, which is the number three serial trademark in the country. Jason Krebs from Tremor Media. We are the largest video advertising company, and we work with most of the people on the panel. We buy advertising and buy inventory from um, thousands of, of video providers around the country, and then we sell advertising to hopefully more than just thousands of advertisers uh, to be on those sites. So yeah, we have an amazing group of you know background, and, and these are the best of breed in this in this space. So. Uh, my company, Omelets, uh, is a seven-year-old branded entertainment company, and we specialize in creating cross-platform, uh, what we call marketing formats that uh, span every screen from film screens to TV to online to mobile shows to you name it. So uh, I'm excited to get into it, so no further ado. I think, why don't you launch the, the first slide? So yeah, why are we here? Uh, three screens. Why? Why three screens? Well, more, the most important thing is because people want them. All the research that everyone is, has shown us, uh, everyone is coming back with, is is that consumers actually want uh, to have the content where they are. So this this the new consumer mantra is all media, anytime, any place, any device. So this is I find this uh, this stat to be incredible. 75% of consumers agree that being able to access similar content across multiple screens improves usefulness, relevancy, and overall opinion. And if you're in the entertainment industry or selling products to human beings, those things are pretty damn important. Uh, so we, what Omelette likes to talk about is the fact that we are, we're not just talking to media sources, we're talking to what is being built by the IT infrastructure called the cloud. So Basically, the reason why we're building the cloud is not because you know, technology can do it. It's because consumers are demanding it. Um, so if consumers are demanding the cloud, then we need, as content creators and networks and studios uh, and, and products, uh, we need to be expert cloud communicators. And that's, that's basically what, uh, what a lot of these case studies will show. Um, we need to tell relevant stories that live wherever consumers are, not where we want them to be. That's a huge shift in thinking. And another shift is letting them have a say. Uh, nine, this is a cr crazy stat that, that we look at and have on our wall at the office. 90% of consumers trust recommendations from people they are connected to 45% more than trust the most trustworthy advertising medium. Why the most trustworthy advertising medium is, is significant because 
86% of consumers no longer trust traditional advertising. So if you can do the math there, um, you know, if, you're in the pro if you are in the business of selling products and people are not trusting your messages, something's got to change, um, which is you know, a big reason why we're up here right now. Um, so yeah, we need to change how we create and distribute marketing and entertainment. It's all becoming the same. And that's the opportunity that these people here are about to walk through. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Chad, who is truly um, taking advantage of this. Yeah, no, that's great, Steve. So I'm going to uh, show you a quick video, but I was excited to share some of the results of our Pepsi Refresh project that we uh, did this year. We actually uh, worked in tandem with, uh, with NBCU and uh, with MSN through their partnership. And, um, uh, and a lot of other uh, media partners, but it, it's, it's funny, a lot of the, these facts that Stephen just um, you know, mentioned to you were a driver of our partnership. I mean, think about it, this was our first pro-social uh, major, major investment into kind of this budding three-screen uh, world where, again, I, we get a lot of credit for being kind of a new thinker, but we are very traditional. And so we needed a, a partner to help us kind of bring it to life, bring some of the trust, uh, as well as help us tell stories. When you think about it, remember, we, remember the project was we're going to give away, if Pepsi is all about refreshing the world, what's the ultimate refresh? It's to be able to kind of refresh communities. And we needed, um, we, we were going to give away a million dollars a month, over a million dollars a month, uh, to around 30 ideas a month. Okay, so if we looked at the end of the year, we, we had 400 plus uh, stories we needed to tell of where the money went. And we are not uh, storytelling people. There are plenty of people who are. And, um, and so that was kind of the question posed to NBCU. And uh, I think they delivered. So let's uh, take a look at the Yeah, can you uh, roll the, the reel, please? Refresh Project grant is little drum roll. <laughs> the Bay Area Food Bank. All right. <laughs> We've got Jill Baru. She's the Chief Marketing Officer for Pepsi joining us. What inspired this great um, charity? Pepsi has always stood for caring about communities and people, and we were just really inspired by all of the finalists today. They have just wonderful ideas. So Pepsi has decided that every single one of them are winners, and we are going to give each one of them $50,000 grants so they can also leave their ideas. <laughs> I think they got it. Thank you so much, Dylan, to Pepsi as well. Just people. Since March, the Pepsi Refresh Project has given away millions of dollars in grant money to people who are making a difference in their communities all across America. We've seen Ivy League graduates recruited to teach in the Mississippi Delta. When you choose Pepsi, you support refreshing projects like these in communities just like yours. It's a small choice that can make a big difference. We are one, we're all just people. One tribe, y'all. One tribe, y'all. My name is Aletha Noonan, and I'm the director of Chicago Operations for the 21st Century Kids First Foundation. Thanks to Pepsi, the 21st Century Kids First Foundation can bring healthy snacks and nutritional guidance to hundreds of kids in Chicago. Helping kids develop good self-esteem and good nutritional habits is what I care about. One tribe, y'all. We are one people. One tribe, y'all. We, 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 one tribe, y'all. No, it's got the I had to make it myself. Great. So, um, sorry, I'm going to wipe away my little tear from. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of our little uh, Pepsi Refresh project. But we, um, when you think about it, I, you know, I, I love these panels, but I feel like sometimes people don't ever leave with any uh, true facts. Uh, we're proud to say we generated 77 million votes 
um, across the year on these projects. Um, the uh, kind of the the afterflow, if you will, the jet stream is incredible because it's also. Uh, so remember, I'm giving away about a, over a million dollars a month, but then the the money that was generated was over millions in incremental grants that kind of that surrounded the Pepsi Refresh project because a lot of these. Um, organizations used it as a time for fundraising for themselves. So they were actually able to kind of turn that even into more, uh, more awareness and more money for themselves. Um, and then, but finally, even things like, of course, it, it, this was pro-social, so we're going to have to uh, do well uh, in social media. And, um, and our, you know, things that are now important, like our likes um, and Facebook, went from, we had about 30,000 to 3 million. So we were, um, you know, really, really pleased uh, with the results and you know I'll answer any questions yeah, um, about uh, that but uh, oh, I guess another big important thing is uh, in, in, the, in this model our three screens while mobile was important we want people to be able to vote immediately it really was um, a, a sort of a national notice we had NBC helping us both tell a national story and then local stories, so what you missed in that kind of second vignette because of time is we did have local NBC talent helping explain the stories in those, uh, you know, in select 10 markets. So that was another great way. That was kind of like our third screen. It was online, national, and then local. And that local story, back to what Stephen mentioned about, you know, trust, uh, you know, we, we had an insight that NBC actually helped us find, which was, you know, the, the trust of your local either news team or local talent could absolutely help us, you know, validate the program. So that, and it's an amazing case study of a, you know, of a brand actually, you know, setting out to change the world using marketing and media. Um, and I think the, you know, the trust thing is huge. I mean, it's becoming a commodity that, you know, is being exchanged between consumers and brands and entertainment. And it's definitely why we're kind of moving to this three screen approach to everything. Um, just based upon the fact that people are not, they don't want to have advertising that stops them or prevents them from living their lives, getting in the way on, on a show or a pre-roll, that kind of stuff may or may not, it may impede <coughs> their, uh, their life. So uh, Cameron, you want to walk us through your case? Sure. Here? Actually, building on trust, um, we had, if we can go to the first slide, we had a uh, company come to us called American Family Insurance. Um, American Family Insurance is a small 19-state um, regional insurance company who was looking to uh, really highlight the fact that their uh, insurance agents were trusted advisors in the community. Um, it was a challenge as the Geico's and um, the, you know, Flo and her crazy discount, discount stuff was really drowning out that noise. They wanted to create an opportunity to really engage deeper and really highlight the, the, um, the level of trust. So we created for them a show called In Gale We Trust. Um, it takes place in a small town um, called Maple Grove. Uh, we surrounded Gale with all of these just amazing quirky characters who live in Maple Grove and really use her as a consultant in their lives. But what we weren't doing and, and what we weren't doing with the show and what we don't do is sit there and pitch and sell insurance. It's not about insurance. Insurance just happens to be one device in which we tell the story. Um, and we've actually done two seasons of In Gale We Trust and we're in active discussions on season three. The screens for us were, were pretty interesting in that in, in the past, this is sort of how we did it, right? We had a banner ad and we ran 100 bajillion banner ads from folks like Tremor, and we then used that to click through to a screen and then prayed that somebody would watch an episode in one of our dot-com environments. Not necessarily the most efficient way to drive millions of viewers into a show. And so where we see the screens coming into play is, is a couple of ways. One is from a syndication standpoint. So Gale and all of our shows are viewable on everywhere from NBC.com and USANetworks.com through to iTunes and Xbox and mobile and video on demand, sort of every one of those platforms that we have access to. But then we've also really evolved and used those three, three screens for different narrative purposes. So the example I like to show for Gale is we actually ran in cinema an episode um, before shows started, so you could watch Gail, engage with Gail, see her in a beautiful high-def e experience. At the end of that, it drove you to, A, remind you to turn off your phone in cinema, but before you do so, to send a text through to us so that when you got home, you were able to watch the show in its entirety on your broadband experience, and then share that out across social media um, via some interesting social media tactics that we employed. So for us, that's sort of an example of how we don't just distribute the show there, but we're also engaging 
with the viewer at the right place at the right time for the narrative and using it as a way to really drive people deeper into that narrative experience. I have just, I think, about a 90 second clip that'll kind of make that come alive a little bit further. If you guys can roll that, please. In Gale We Trust is an original comedic web series centering on a fictional American family insurance agent and the offbeat townspeople of Maple Grove. Right. With an aggressive distribution strategy in place, Gale was seen by millions of consumers. Anchored on NBC.com, the show page provided the opportunity to view episodes and special behind-the-scenes content, play casual games, join the Facebook community, interact directly with company tools, and get in touch with the Gale in your neighborhood. But that's just part of the story. The show was heavily promoted on air, in co-branded digital units, and tagged TV spots, directing consumers to watch the show on usanetworks.com, Hulu, iTunes, VOD, and in rich media banners across a multitude of video ad networks. Gail was accessible anytime and nearly anywhere our busy consumer wanted to watch, and she did. Press and industry pundits took notice as well, and agreed, Gail was a hit. In season two, we've extended our distribution by including both cinema and SMS to the mix. And once again, we have a hit on our hands. In Gale We Trust, a bold move to reframe the discussion around trusted advice, all wrapped up in an entertaining multi-channel program. And trust us, it worked. Oh. That's just one example of what we're doing at NBCU across multiple screens. Thanks, Cameron. That, that's a great case study. Um, so we'll have questions after this, but I want to keep kind of getting through this so we have some time for them. So, Jan, can you? Sure. We'll, uh, before we show the Wendy's reel, Wendy's approached us last year asking us to help them reach and market to fast food lovers across MSN, and I think the reel speaks for itself. Can, can we run the reel? Presented by Wendy's, who knows what's fast, fresh, funny, and what's really happening in the world today. I'm Jeff Guy. No matter how unbelievable it looks, I promise you, it happened for real. Thank you. So, Chad, I loved your question about you, you want to leave with facts. So I'm, I'm filled with them. So, so it's actually great that, that you're asking that. So we couldn't show the data from Wendy's, unfortunately, because it's proprietary. So I wanted to sh share quickly two other great c case studies that ran with us over the last year or two. Is anyone familiar with Tom's Shoes or buy Tom's Shoes? It's a really great story. That they're a uh, retail and online shoe manufacturer that creates shoes, um, and they, they allow people to... Um, it's a one-for-one -one program where they provide shoes for underprivileged children throughout Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And it's shocking how many children don't have shoes and the health issues that, that rise as a result of that. So um, Tom Shoes created a, a One Day Without Shoes campaign, and they wanted to drive awareness to it. So they came to us across four screens, which was Xbox, television, massive or in-game dynamic advertising, as well as MSN, and they wanted to drive awareness to this day. So this is the result that we can share with you. So in terms of aided brand awareness, people that were exposed to a single ad across a single platform, 55% were aware of that One Day Without Shoes campaign. 
when they were exposed to four different ads across four different platforms, 98% were aware of that day. 98%, near 100% were aware of the one day without shoes experience. In terms of post ad actions, who actually did what? So when they were exposed to a single channel recall ad, 58% took a post ad action. When they were exposed to four, 97% of people took a post ad action. 97%, and what did they do? They went to toms.com, they went online to purchase shoes, they went to a store, they connected with Tom's through social media and so on. The one I would call out here is 18%, I think it's 18 or 19, 19% of people that were exposed to a single ad went and purchased shoes at toms.com. But when it was four times across four different channels, 51% of people actually bought shoes at toms.com, 51%. And the last one I'll show you, it's a little bit older, but near and dear to our hearts in this room, the film Avatar. So Fox came to us and said, we want to drive awareness for this visceral, deeply immersive television, excuse me, uh, TV, uh, <laughs> film experience. Uh, I think it was a movie, right? And uh, 16 different markets across the world. The U.S. was actually the smallest media market that they came to us for support. 15 different other markets across the world to drive, tune in for the, uh, for the premiere. So it ran across Xbox, Windows Live, mobile, and here are some of the results. Post ad actions. So when they were exposed to a single channel, 58% took a post ad action. So what did they do? They went to the website, they viewed the trailer, they, they sought more information. When it was two different channels, 68% took a post ad action. Three channels, 88% took a post ad action. In terms of the holy grail of advertising, true purchase intent, post ad film viewership in this case, when people were exposed to a single ad across a platform, 15% went to go see the movie. When it was three different, three different channels and platforms, 44%. 44% went to go see the film. So for us, it's pretty clear the data suggests, the data demands that the more screens you add, the more platforms you add to your ad campaigns, the more efficacy you drive for your dollars. I think it also shows that Microsoft was solely responsible for the uh, largest grossing box office film of all time. <laughs> and uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Katie, you want to? Yeah. Um, can we go ahead and, and start my presentation? In case you guys haven't been to the, uh, the, into the cereal aisle lately, I just wanted to refresh you on what it looks like. Um, I challenge you to find <laughs> Honey Bunches of Oats in that shelf set, particularly if you've never tried it before. Um, the average consumer, there's about 700 million in advertising spent specifically in this category. The average consumer could see a cereal ad once every two minutes if they wanted to. And so, as you can imagine, it's really tough to break through in this category. The good news is I get to go to work and I get to show charts like this. Uh, that first box you see is what we were seeing results view when we did Hispanic advertising solely with television spots. That second box is when we started our first integration with uh, Telemundo, and I'll be going over that in a second. The second one is an integration that we started adding screens and adding touch points. And I've been up probably double digits. Um, I'm Double digits, a little better in some, some weeks and months um, over the past year. So we've had fantastic results from going to more than one screen. The first thing we did was relatively basic, a pretty standard integration. Um, we partnered with Telemundo and some of their Telemundo talent to have a regular integration to Levantate, their early morning program. We saw great results, and we actually saw a much more interesting interaction between television and online than we'd expected. So when we went back and realized we had to lap these results, we had to figure out what to do next. And we took the elements that really worked for that, the celebrity involvement, the interaction between consumers, between web and, and, on, and television, and then something that we knew to be important in the serial category, which is that first trial experience, that woman on the street experience. We developed this much um, stronger integration where we took a, a Telemundo talent, Rochelle Diaz, um, she's done vignettes for us, she's done an online presence for us, and we've shown um, woman on the street vignettes trying the cereal for the first time. That's been fantastic for us. Um, we have seen a lot of consumers interacting on the website, talking about recipes, talking about Rochelle Diaz and her, her love for the cereal. And I gotta tell you, when you get people excited about talking about someone liking for cereal that isn't themselves, we're, we're feeling really excited about it. So for us, as we're looking at how we can continue all these touch points, we looked at the things that have been successful, celebrity, web, online, um, presence, television, vignettes, and we figure out what can we do to dial it up. Uh, we launched a new integration just a uh, couple weeks ago where we actually took the things that were successful, 
saw that social media interaction where consumers were talking to each other and realized that the Hispanic consumer for us um, is, is really interested in mobile applications. And there aren't really a lot of Spanish language apps out there for, for them to um, interact with and engage with. So we took all those things and did something a little different for the serial category. We partnered with uh, Giancarlo Scanella, who is a Latin American Grammy-winning artist. Um, he is fantastic. We've commissioned a song from him. That song is now playing throughout a very similar integration, but we have online components. We have mobile components where um, consumers are driven to Facebook for the very first time to actually start interacting, downloading these mobile songs. We've taken that one step further. We have the benefit of having a really big package that people see on average of 11 times before they toss something out. And so they were taking that online presence, we're taking that television presence, we're taking that mobile presence and putting it on pack to leverage a, a big uh, contest that's actually driving excitement, driving awareness, and, and driving uh, um, a lot of trial of our cereal, which is really critical for us. Um, I'll show you just a, a brief clip of that. Can you roll the, the video? For those of you who don't speak Spanish, he's actually talking about thinking positive and um, how it, important it is to wake up every day with that feeling of, of being excited about the day that's coming at you, which is really the embodiment of the brand for us. So he was a, a great fit for us. We've been so excited about the results that we've seen in the Hispanic market that we're actually able to experiment in the general market a little bit more. Um, you're going to be seeing a new mobile sitcom that's only available on um, cell phones for the first couple of weeks that then gets played out across multiple screens. Um, tele, uh, it's going to be on web, it's going to be on Facebook, and the feature is really set in our plants. Our uh, historical advertising has been people talking about how much they love making the cereal. Now you actually get to see the behind the scenes of what it's like to make cereal at the Honey Bunches of Oats plant. Thanks, Katie. It's, uh, Thank you. I mean, what's really interesting about Katie is that you know a screen is the back of her box, you know, and specifically with uh, the launch of these these new entertainment uh, properties, she's able to use that screen in you know a lot of different. I mean, how many like for for that show? How many boxes are you actually putting? Are you promoting? I think it's four million boxes. So it, on top of the uh, advertising impressions that we're getting and on top of the web impressions that we're getting, we're getting that reinforcement of four million boxes that people see 11 times. So significant number of impressions. And it's amazing real estate on your kitchen table. So moving on, Jason, you want to walk us through? Sure. Uh, we're sorry for bringing PowerPoint to a room with four disco balls. Uh, <laughs> but Stephen made us, so. We, we, we commence with the PowerPoint. So we're a little different than everyone who, uh, most of the folks on, this, on the panel, where we're not creating content. Uh, we're distributing, advertising, and hopefully generating results. This generic household air freshener, Katie knows who it is, but I swore her to secrecy. Um, the headline there was meant to not let you throw eggs at me, uh, where we're saying that we're outperforming cable. It's just really to help <coughs> illustrate what we do. We partner with so many of the people in this room and at this conference where we're buying impressions, video impressions. We add our secret sauce, our technology to it, and we buy at very healthy rates from cable companies at that. And then we're able to position it to marketers and, and give them real results. And here you can see the objective was to generate awareness for the advertiser's product. Uh, the advertiser took some of the money from their television campaign uh, last summer and allocated that in 15 second spots to the web and were able to increase brand recall pretty, um, pretty substantially as you see here 
uh, where we're at 45% over to, to, to 23%, and it moved on with message recall. And brand and message and likability, those are things that the advertiser asked us to do. Um, what's important here, for those of you who like numbers, uh, you have the cable TV schedule uh, CPM, and I'm not afraid to tell you that the, the CPM on, across our uh, uh, grouping of sites was much higher, but that's because the advertiser is buying results. We prefer not to tell our clients to buy standard impressions. Instead, tell us the result you want to achieve, and we'll map all the impressions that we're serving just to hit that particular result. And it works. So brand recall versus uh, for other online video for this campaign, much higher. Red being those uh, tremor, the gray is uh, uh, is the online video norm. Now here's the online, the, the advertiser uh, TV norms, as you can see. So the red is still what we were producing in terms of recall for the brand, the message, and likability, and that's generic uh, standard television norms. And here we see the same creative. And this was a campaign that was running across media on our uh, distribution, which was, it, it is PC based, but it's also mobile and the third screen here, obviously TV, that they were running separately. So we were able to find these uh, same, similar folks and we were able to drive results greater than what they were seeing in their TV by, which works very much to their benefit. So we have, uh, we're the largest distribution. Uh, we have video scanning where we make sure that we're finding the videos and putting them in the right categories and making sure that the ad, each ad delivery that we serve is hitting your ultimate KPI. And that's how we do what we do. At their best of breed. Um, so yeah, we have obviously <coughs> case study after case study of why and how this is uh, going to be the future of what we do. Um, the the question I have, um, starting with Cameron, is how do I mean for content creators for people that tell because all of this <coughs> the kind of the the thing that ties it all together is is the story before you get to thinking about the media. Uh, what is the idea? What is the story? And how, what is the process like at NBC to start thinking about solving a business problem with a story that lives in multiple screens? Um, so a couple of things. The way that we typically work is we'll sit down with a brand marketer very, very early in the process. We're seeing more and more that we're bring, being brought in months, if not quarters, in advance versus days in advance, which is uh, re refreshing. Um, we do that, and then we go through what is basically a traditional television development cycle. So we're throwing a lot of ideas out there. We're tapping into our own network of folks and really coming up with a show that we believe is first and foremost great quality entertainment. It's stuff that I feel confident putting the Peacock logo on, but we know that it really embodies the... The, the message that the brand is looking to convey. And so what we see then is we're able to distribute it broadly because it's great content, but we're seeing you know double digit increases in terms of brand preference and purchase intent, sort of all of the key attributes, like in the Tremor presentation, um, from the presenting brand. So those are, that's sort of the process, right. um, but it, it's, it, we, lead with the, we lead with the content. When we feel like things are getting a little too heavy handed, we push back because at the end of the day, when we think about the screens and the platforms that I own, I have to protect that viewer's interest as much as the advertiser's interest, and so we won't cross a line um, in order to just serve what the advertiser is doing at the expense of the of the content. Is okay. Um, so we do have uh, about six minutes left. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but if you guys have questions, please step up to the mic right now, and uh, we'll see if we can get address uh, all those. Chad, um, from a strategy standpoint. How early in a in a marketing process do you guys start thinking about using, you know, a three screen process to reach consumers? I mean, does it start with, with the deep dive into the target, or what, like, can you describe a little bit of how you kind of got there? It, it actually does. Uh, we try to be true to starting with the target, but uh, you know, and I would love to, to confab with my team, this peers here because it, there's a lot of times there's parallel pathing. So, um, but in, in theory, right, the Pepsi Refresh Project started in um, February of last year, and we would have um, kind of known our targets and figured that out of what the communication needs would have been uh, in October, immediately briefed uh, the media partners, and, that, and that's when we would have first kind of uh, started talking to NBCU. And, and, but, you know, there's a lot of course correcting, of course, along the way 
where you're, you know a piece of content isn't working, and then you know and you know let's move that to another target, etc. Right. But I, I would say that it it was uh, you know if we were asking exact time about you know four months prior, which uh, you know to Cameron's point, uh, it used to be you know we would be kind of there about a month prior, and you know and, and I think we have realized that. We are going to have to try things to do things differently. It's going to be painful for a content provider in the beginning, because right, the strategy may change. Right. When you you, you nailed the the concept, and yet it's like, oh yeah, I'm sorry, we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where the f probably some frustration can come in. But yeah. um, I think we are absolutely. I I would love to get to a six month out, yep. so that we could all perfect it, and have the perfect kind of setup. I mean, yeah, the, no, the going, notion yeah. that 25 to 54 is a target, and that's what people have been buying media for a generation, within five years we'll look back on that and just laugh that that's how advertising was bought. Amen. You know, the, the very notion that you think that just a 25-year-old is the same thing as a 54-year-old, you know, you laugh at it. Even you look at two, two people, all you take two 35-year-old men, if one person, from our point of view, just looked at five nature videos, and another 35-year-old uh, person just looked at five um, uh, monster truck videos, how are they possibly ready to receive the same advertising with those? They're in completely different mindsets, doing completely different things. And it's not just contextual, but it's what, they're, you know, what time of day is it? What kind of machine are they on? What have they, they interacted with previously? There's scores of data out there that we're able to pull out uh, across three screens and say this is the We've heard this before, proverbial right ad, right place, right time, and it's, and it's not just a broad context of a demographic. I think that's a really important point, especially for people that are creating content, is uh, imagine, I mean, the future is, for us is definitely uh, looking at that, that those really deep dive target uh, segmentation and <coughs> understanding who they are, where they are, and then creating relevant stories for them as opposed to going into my room and you know, coming up with an amazing screenplay. Uh, we're launching, you know, we're launching a feature film for um, Hispanic market, and we, to Katie's point about the, mo I mean, we had no idea. Once we pulled back the curtain and started looking and, and understanding their behaviors, it was like, oh my God, they're rabid technophiles. Their mobile devices are, are everything to them. So we're doing a huge push on mobile uh, for, to launch a feature film um, that's fully funded by a brand. Um, Jan, I have a question for you. Um, if you have any advice for content creators, I know Microsoft is kind of in this amazing space of like you're, you're basically building a cloud, you're selling the cloud, you're creating hardware. Uh, it's, you guys are an amazing company. Do you have any advice uh, from your standpoint to content creators on what they should be thinking or how, how they should be approaching this kind of this, this area that we're talking about? It's pretty simple. It's just listen to the consumers. Follow the consumers, right? Follow the brands, follow the consumers. It is, it is a core pillar of our strategy around the cloud to make sure that we're going where the consumers are going. Whether the device is almost irrelevant, people are adding devices to their mix. They're not subtracting them, right? So that's our strategy, follow the consumer. Yeah. All right. Um, I just got a question. OK. We have a question? <coughs> yeah, a question? Um, this might be for Cameron in particular, but I was curious about the cost for a brand um, the, the case study with Bingale we trust, and I don't know if you can share specifics, but that's a regional brand you, you <coughs> mentioned. What, what is the difference <coughs> with them in putting together a whole show and underwriting a whole show that I'm assuming would need a decent staff of comedy writers um, versus running a TV, typical TV campaign? Can you talk about that at all? I can. Um, I'm... I'm lucky enough that my client has talked about it first, so I can say what she has said, which is, in Gale We Trust, Costs American Family Insurance, 1 60th of their overall media budget, yet in order for her to see the same results that she saw in terms of sort of wherever on the funnel was important to her, all the way down to contacting an agent, she would have had to have spent about $40 million more than she spent in traditional media to get those same results. So what that means is, well, A, I'm clearly underpricing my product, and B, it, it, really does, it really does work in tandem with media, even for someone on a regional level who does have a lot of market waste when they're just not available in those markets. So it, it is, she is, they are seeing it as a highly efficient buy, and I think that's why we're seeing more and more brands come to us as, to, to put that level of expertise in terms of telling stories on top of the brand insights that they bring to the table. 
And I can speak to that as well. I had a, a, a similar execution, and for us, cost-wise, it's, it's comparable to what we'd be spending to develop regular television advertising media. So, question? To follow up on in Gale We Trust, Cameron, I was curious. Did you mention that it was available on iTunes or Apple TV? Um, it's available on, it w was, is available on iTunes. And was as that a, as a download, as a paid download? What we've found across our shows is as a free podcast versus a, I'm not going to make $100 million selling these at three ninety nine a piece because <laughs> there's just not a lot of, awareness of them, but I can get a really great audience who's looking for high quality contact, content in the podcast space. That's primarily our strategy. And iTunes loves it because it's great content and really proves out the podcast model. So we have a really great relationship with them in that space. And I believe it's still, it's still available there if you want to, if you want to go watch it. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. A couple more questions. Uh, yeah. Um, what's, what's pretty obvious uh, is that you really require very close collaboration of multiple stakeholders in developing a campaign like this. My question is about the process behind it. Maybe Chad or Katie could help. Yeah. Um, do you really require a C-level sponsor and a you know, operational level champion to run this, uh, to coordinate activities? And how, how does that happen in the environment, uh, in a corporate uh, you know, uh, behavioral environment perspective? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, it's, it's messy. <laughs> it's really, really messy. Um, it because of the right the, the business needs. Uh, I wish I, I, I'm going to say that Katie seems a little team might be a little more um, cleaner, uh, but for us, you know, really messy. We have had a lot of passion projects that do come in that you know speak right to the brand, and for a variety of reasons, it doesn't you know play out that it ever actually makes it, you know, I, I feel like we might be more frustrating than even like a, a network, the net old network model because of like getting the, the show on the air. So, but I would say that um, the, my new recommendation for any content provider to help find it is a lot of the media agencies are now having a, a special content team built within the media agency. So look for the OMDs and the Group Ms because they're going to have someone that is because uh, remember, this is separate from then their creative agencies in, in the same organizations that do kind of want to do it all. And th these, uh, you know, pieces, of these groups within these media uh, planning and buying organizations are actually looking to bring fresh content to brands. And we're also, and so we're, we're getting reached out to, um, to basically be um, show running, you know, literally like what traditional show running is to television, a company like Omelette is brought on to basically high level come up with the idea and see it all the way through every media and having working directly with those content um, departments in the media companies, that's a huge part of, um, of having just like a very small team of people making a lot of uh, very important executive decisions um, and just, you know, everyone, you know, the, the key is definitely making decisions timely. Yeah, yeah I, I, th I think our process is probably a little cleaner than Pepsi's just because our company is not quite as large. Um, the good news is that if you get the right internal executive sponsor in terms of not necessarily the show or the, the content, but the idea, you can partner with um, media agencies. We actually have a great working relationship with both MediaVest and MV42, who are our media agencies who help us coordinate this type of thing across multiple touch points. We couldn't do it without their help. Okay, one more and then we got to wrap this up. My question is for the panel in general. As a content provider looking across these three platforms that you're putting out and uh, creating content to be uh, performed on these, on these things, and we're looking towards the relationship that we have with a particular brand that we want to come on for the show, what would you suggest as our level of understanding or our level of intelligence or market awareness about how all these things operate? That will allow us to give the most, to have the most amount of influence in the direction that we actually have that brand take for our show. If that's yeah, I I, I actually take that. Um, I think as a content creator or a content producer, I think knowing who you are and what stories you're amazing at and passionate about, and defining your brand, um, and then finding you know audiences that communicate to your exact you know what you do well. Because when we think about hiring people to execute the stories that we're trying to sell products with, 
um, we're just looking down the list of, of brands, basically, of people that are creating those stories, and we're saying, hey, let's package that content producer with that business problem, and let's go and make some crazy shit happen. So with that, thank you guys very much. Um, thank you guys very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our session will begin in 10 minutes.